In the past few days, the Abbey community has been doing an overview of 2017. It was quite an extraordinary year, uh, rejoicing at all the things that came to pass. And it's also an opportunity for the community to look back and see things that might have to be adjusted, things that might have to be adapted, or even some things that have to be rethought. And that, um, and this is usually due because the Abbey over the years are um, presence in the world on a lot of different levels has increased and the, uh, the growth of the community just continues to keep going. So as these things happen, you just sometimes have to rethink how you've been doing things. And we've done this a few times in the past 15 years, going from one nun with two cats up to now 15 residents with four cats. And when I personally look at my journey, there's a lot of qualities that I have found that not only are helpful to be in community, but also crucial as these fluxes and changes and adaptations and growth. One of the things that I do do is that I think a lot about the Abbey's mission statement, which we've heard a few times this past few days. And I really did want to repeat it again because it really does inspire me to cultivate particular qualities that will help me to model, embody, inspire, and to be able to articulate this long-term mission statement of the Abbey. So Shravasti Abbey supports a flourishing monastic community, whether learning, we're learning and practicing the Buddha's ancient teachings, cultivate peace in the hearts of residents, visitors, and the world. We seek to preserve the Buddha's teachings purely, to root them deeply in Western soil, to share them with others, to build an enduring song, and to serve sentient beings for as long as space remains. So from my side, that is a piece that keeps me inspired to cultivate qualities that are necessary to be able to articulate and embody that over the course of my life here in community. However, I have to say that um, that is not just, um, these qualities are not just crucial for the Abbey community in order to sustain itself and to flourish in the world. But there's a lot of um, different versions of community. You know, we've got I mean, families are kind of communities, workplaces are kind of communities, classrooms are communities, activist groups, social groups. There's some form of community that we all engage in. And so some of these qualities that I've thought about, I think that they, they're not just about the community here, but I think any type of, of group uh, experience together with each other. So one of the qualities I have found crucial in being here, staying here, growing and flourishing is this quality called resilience. So I wanted to share a little bit about what I read about this morning and then some of my takes a little bit through a more of a, a Dharma viewpoint as well. First of all, it has a wonderful um, definition. They actually say that it is an ineffable, an inexpressible quality. So ineffable means sometimes it's hard to put into words. You can't like dr draw a circle around and say, this is the definition, definition of resilience. It's, it's a quality that we embody, that we grow, but they say that it's, it's, it's a fairly inexpressible thing. You can't nail it down. But what they do see experientially is that some people, it allows some people who get knocked down by life, knocked down by samsara, cyclic existence, come back stronger than ever. Rather than letting failure overcome them and drain their resolve, they find a way to, quote, rise from the ashes. Psychologists have identified some of the factors that make somebody resilient, among them a positive attitude, optimism, the ability to regulate emotions, and the ability to see failure as a form of helpful feedback. Even after misfortune, resilient people are blessed with such an outlook that they're able to change course and continue on. It means bouncing back from difficult experiences. And what is really kind of reassuring about the little bit that I read this morning is that it's not an extraordinary quality to have. They actually put it in the ordinary category, that people commonly demonstrate this quality being resilient does not mean that people don't experience difficulty, don't experience adversity or tragedies or distress. Emotional pain and sadness are, well, we know, the common experience of living beings. 
And that people who have emotional pain and sadness is very common for all of us to suffer adversity or trauma in our lives. In fact, they say that one of the qualifying, one of the qualifiers is that resilience is likely to involve considerable emotional distress. So it's almost like it's called forth, it's nourished by when we run into adversity. It is not a trait that people either have or don't have. It is, it involves behaviors, thoughts, and actions that can be l learned and developed in everybody. So being at the Abbey or maybe being community, whatever version of that you have, um, there are some tools that help us cultivate this inevitable quality. Um, and some of these, I mean, they're, they're, they're pretty obvious, but once again, if we want to cultivate this resilience, which I think in the face of just the changing world with everything that's going on, this sounds like a quality that's like almost mandatory if we want to keep ourselves sane. So the first one is one of the tools that helps cultivate this ineffable quality is good relationships with close family members, friends, community members, and others who are important to us. And this is something very interesting. It says, accepting help and support from those who care about you and will listen to you strengthens your resilience. So being willing to be the recipient of other people's generosity and kindness is one of the things that nourishes resilience. And it is also proven that people who are active in any type of civic organization, interfaith organizations, social groups, and things like that, that also helps because it helps us to reclaim hope. One of the things that, that I'm getting a sense of is resilience is a wonderful antidote to sometimes feeling like you're, you're hopeless or you're feeling discouraged. So widening the circle of our life really helps, as well as assisting others who are in need or need to be taken care of. So it's this whole idea about being the recipient of other people's generosity, fosters resilience, as does widening our circle and not thinking so much about ourselves, but actually turning our generosity out into the world. The second one is avoiding seeing crisis as insurmountable problems. You can't change the fact that highly stressful events happen, but you can change how you interpret and respond to these events. So from here, the, the first thing that came to my mind is that from a Dharma perspective, we've got impermanence. And that when we have these problems, to see that they are not going to last forever, that there is an impermanence, that they are go not going to last, and they're going to most certainly change. And also to say, I keep using it as an antidote, and I find it to be more helpful in grounding me and widening my, my perspective is when I say, when these problems show up, Semke, this is samsara. This is, by its very nature, samsara is unsatisfactory. You're going to have problems. You're going to have difficulties. You're going to have adversity. That's part of this. And it's going to change, because that's another characteristic of dukkha, that it is impermanent. This, the next one is to take decisive action. Respond and act on adverse situations as much as you can, rather than detaching completely from them and the stresses of life and wishing that they would go away. Okay, that's one option we have. Or stewing in them. Okay, repressing them, not wanting to handle them, not wanting to deal with them, so we just stuff them. Using the Dharma or compassionate communication first with ourselves, touching in with what we think is going on. Okay, so when these adverse things happen, is one of our actions first to go inward. Okay, what's happening? What, why is this difficulty arising? What part do I ha have to play in it? Take responsibility for an ownership for what part we may be contributing to the adversity, to the difficulty. And then what they say is to figure out what we might do to keep it moving, to keep our hearts open for it to move to a, to a resolution. So it's like these adverse situations, when we to bring them into like how big really are they, to keep them moving and to not run away or to not stuff them someplace. This one we all know very well, but it is certainly worth repeating. 
is that it says that looking for opportunities for self-discovery, people often learn something deeply about themselves and grow as a result of struggles. You know this. But what they have even, I mean, this is coming from a psychological context, and I've just imbued it with a little bit of Dharma. But the psychologists have done lots of studies, and they say that across the board, most people who experience tragedies, trauma, and hardship have reported better relationships, greater sense of inner strength, even while they feel vulnerable, increased sense of self-worth, a more developed spirituality, and a heightened appreciation for life. And I think this is one of the biggest understandings of living in community, is that we don't, if we don't grow, if we don't take advantage of the adversities that are certainly going to come. And what we do with it as well, I mean, that's pretty much up to us. Do we fight it or do we meet it with openness and willingness and use it to transform our minds? Because across the board, the human family is able, is able to transform and to grow in strength and to nourish this beautiful quality of resilience. The next one is keeping things in perspective. Even when facing very painful events, try to consider the situation in a broader context and keep a long-term perspective. Avoid blowing the event out of proportion. So when we are in community or family at work, it seems to be that the more we know each other, the closer we are, the smaller things become really, really big problems. I mean, with strangers, we're really kind of copacetic. Ah, whatever, you know, you want to put the, the cups upside down, you want to do the water bowls that way, you want to do it this way, ah, that's fine. But for community and family and class and work, it's a big deal. And pretty much it's the eight world of concerns, okay? So they're playing themselves out, attached to either some sort of sense pleasure or praise or reputation, or we're pushing back against either our version to a bad reputation, criticism, something unpleasant, not having what we want, some sort of stuff, some sort of acquisition. So what I have found helpful with keeping things in perspective is when I run up against these difficulties, where with the Dharma, where is this situation in my long-term aspiration for awakening? Is this a big deal in the long term? Or is this just a little moment in time where perhaps my self-centered thought is getting jabbed at a little bit, and of course it makes a really, really big problem out of a very, very small thing? So for me to continually come back and say, what in this situation can I use to benefit the long-term goal of bodhicitta? Is, is, it, is it even in the mix? Or do I just need to just say, drop it? This is not helping. This is not useful. It doesn't matter. This just doesn't matter. And when it does matter, these little things, and I find myself reactive and sensitive and defensive, chances are my self-centered thoughts got some investment in being right or getting their, its way. The next one is to maintain a hopeful outlook. An optimistic outlook enables us to expect that good things will happen in our life. Try to visualize what we want rather than worrying about what we fear or to take into account the hopeful, wonderful things that are working to counterbalance the mind that sees only problems or what is not working. So this whole practice that we have of rejoicing, even in the middle of adversity, is a very wonderful medicine to take. And then last but not least, even the psychologists say that meditation and spiritual practice helps people build connections and restore hope. So the key is to identify the ways that are likely to work well for each and every one of us as our personal aspiration to cultivate this resiliency. Because I have found after being in this community that having a, a, all of these qualities about resilience, it helps to just go with the changes, go with the, I have here, it, it helps us to navigate the rushing waters of cyclic existence with a kind of grace and strength and ease that will make our suffering, which is, as His Holiness says, a lot of the times is self-created, and gives us the skill to deal with samsara in a much wiser, more fruitful way. So I'm, I mean, that's one of my, after reading this and thinking about this, one of my commitments for this year is to see if I can foster a little bit more resilience in my own mind to be able to sort of navigate with a little bit more ease, a little bit more wisdom, a little bit more joy 
because this, things are going to change, things are going to get, the rugs can get pulled out from under us, things are going to go not the way that we had planned, and what are we going to do about it? So, 